So we're live now. Um, so welcome to the Center for Enterprise Society Leadership Talk for Spring 2022. Um, just a bit of a bit about what this is. So this is basically a Center for Enterprise and Society initiative. What is CES? CES is a think tank housed within ULAB, the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. And uh, so this leadership talk, which we've been running for over six years now, basically aims to showcase the leadership journeys of uh, civil society business leaders in Bangladesh. In some cases, of course, leaders are posted out of Bangladesh, as is the case with Mr. Anir Van Bhomik, uh, who's our leadership speaker for this term. Mr. Bhomik is currently the regional director for Swiss Contact in Central and East Africa. So uh, this talk is, of course, as I said, organized by CES. Dhaka Tribune is a partner. This is going live with the Dhaka Tribune Facebook page, and this live will be shared on the ULAB Facebook page as well as the CES and the ULAP EMBA Facebook pages. So stay tuned and of course, you know, follow our Facebook pages for future events. So with this, I would like to invite the ULAP Vice Chancellor, Professor Imran Rahman, to come and say a few words, start this event and also introduce our speaker for this term. Over to you, Professor Imran Rahman. Thank you very much, uh, Sajid. And it's, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker. Um, but before that, let me say that at ULAB, we are very pleased uh, to have a research center like the Center for Enterprise and Society. Um, you know, the founders of the university <clears throat> put research uh, as one of the most important agenda. And, uh, you know, when we started this university in 2004, we, had, uh, we started from scratch. And it's, it's a pleasure to see that research centers such as Center for Enterprise and Society, uh, Center for Sustainable Development, Center for Qualitative Studies, all of them have now started um, quite successfully to bid for and win uh, international research grants, uh, which leads to uh, international collaborative research. So this is a really hopeful start for us. So coming back to the talk today, uh, the talk today is about the career journey of a development practitioner. Uh, what an interesting topic, particularly for those viewers who are looking at developing their career, not just within the confines of Bangladesh, but uh, globally. And I have always felt that, you know, Bangladeshis, um, there's so many talented Bangladeshis who are perhaps not getting the challenge and opportunities in many cases within Bangladesh. And there is nothing wrong. In fact, I always encourage uh, young Bangladeshi professionals to seek their uh, professional development wherever it takes them. Uh, we can uh, represent our country. We can make our country proud by reaching the top of our, of, of our career journey in any part of the world. That's my, uh, you know, that's the way I look at things. Um, and uh, what better, um, you know, leadership talk speaker than Onirban Bhomik, because Onirban, as uh, Sajid mentioned a bit earlier, is currently the regional director for Central and East Asia for Swiss Contact. Um, he's leading Swiss Contact's journey in the region to be a resilient organization. So that's an amazing uh, mandate that he's working for. And before Swiss Contact, um, and before, uh, sorry, before re relocating to East Africa, Onirban was the country director for Swiss Contact Bangladesh. And, you know, we've had very interesting and fruitful collaborations uh, with uh, Onirban and ULAB. Uh, he's been at ULAB uh, in several capacity uh, to, to talk to our students uh, and faculty. Onirban designed and managed a large scale private sector development program for UK aid in Bangladesh as well. And uh, as an international development expert, Onirban worked in South and Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe and South America. So a, a truly kind of go, global career path that has brought him now to East Africa. So without further ado, I would uh, welcome and uh, hand over the sort of uh, Zoom stage to Onirban. Thank you for appearing before this leadership talk. Great. Thank you, sir. Um, 
So yeah, so we'll kick this off. And because it is online and you know, like we've done our previous leadership talks, we'll keep it somewhat conversational. And so Anubandha, you know, let's just kick this off without further ado. Just, just let's just jump right in and talk about, you know, to basically, you know, keep going from where Iman sir left off, uh, which is why don't you tell us about where you are right now? And by that I mean what position you're holding, uh, what geography, what your role is currently. And of course, maybe some reflections on how you like this position. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, um, gratitude team and sir for a very kind and generous introduction and Center for Enterprise Development and Leadership of ULAB University. Thank you very much for this opportunity for being able to share my experience with, with the viewers in Bangladesh and across the region as well as beyond. Um, going back to the question, my current role as a regional director, I'm responsible for Swiss contacts operation in uh, Central and Eastern Africa. So within my portfolio, I'm responsible for our country-based operation in seven countries. We have our country operations in these seven Central and East African countries. And my job is really to kind of lead Swiss contacts journey into um, designing interventions which will tackle key development challenges for not only for now, but most importantly for next five to 10 years. And in the process, my task also is to develop the organizational capabilities um, so that we remain fit for the future challenges because we live in a very dynamic world. Uh, development challenges um, evolve fairly fast. So from the organizational point of view, we need an organization which is capable of responding to these challenges. We need to have right processes in place and most importantly, we need to have uh, people um, who are the centerpiece of everything that we do with the right skill set, right mindset, right attitude. And, and also a very vibrant leadership pipeline uh, development is also my task where you know, we will have to have um, leaders being groomed within the organization who are capable of taking greater challenges uh, for future. So I'm based in Nairobi now, um, and I my job involves traveling around East Africa quite a lot uh, because we have our country presence and and project operations in different countries. Yeah, so that's that's the current role that I have now for Swiss Contact. And how are you liking it? Because you were with the Bangladesh, the South Asia regional office for a long time, and uh, so how's this transition to Africa been so far? Um, it has been an amazingly steep learning curve, I would say, because, um, you know, the contexts are so different, uh, the colleagues are different, the development challenges, even though at the core of the development challenge, it's all about uh, promoting inclusive growth, helping people to uh, get on the pathway of prosperity, working to strengthen the private sector um, that are there around them. But the context is so different. The, the political environment is different. The countries are on a very different economic trajectory. So just to give you one example on the technical side of the role, um, in Bangladesh, we were on the journey of becoming a middle income country. And we were working with private sector, which were the private sector and the businesses were quite vibrant. And they were, um, they were clear about the growth trajectory. And the uncertainty was, slightly different kind of uncertainty uh, that the businesses were facing here. Uh, and at the same time, we also had a very clear focus on private sector development, private sector led um, growth, and the whole uh, ambition in Bangladesh for poverty alleviation was quite clear from the political leadership, from the prime minister and everybody. So, so that set a very clear direction in terms of where we would like to go. Uh, whereas in Africa, it's very hard yet uh, because the economies are at a much earlier stage, at a much early growth stage economies. Um, the private sector operation is evolving and there are lots of uncertainties around political stability, um, governance, uh, infrastructure is extremely weak. And at the same time, we'll also have to understand that the country sizes are very different. Countries in Africa are massive. Um, so having the right infrastructure in place for such a huge geographical um, scope itself is 
a big challenge when the public sector is weak. So, so the development context is very different. Now, when it comes down to the organizational culture and the practice, obviously because of a, we are in a very different culture and the cultural orientations are very different. Uh, the management, the leadership challenges are quite different. So from that aspect, it has been a great shift, great learning journey for me. And I think I'm learning every day in terms of how to deal with new challenges and new challenges are coming up um, time and again. And I think later during the talk, uh, we will touch base on some of the key challenges on the context and what makes leadership, people development, um, creating a resilient organization, more challenging in the context where I am um, now. Um, that would be an interesting perspective, I believe, to share with our colleague, uh, with the with the participants of this webinar. Sure, sure. And, and in case people are wondering, because not everyone who's watching is going to be a NGO professional or a development sector professional, but Orivan does career track where he's gone from managing the country office in Bangladesh to now uh, working in a larger region. Of course, the entire continent of Africa is the sort of career path a lot of people aspire to have, especially in the de development sector, because Africa will not go and seek out corporate jobs, although you know there's every reason to. It, it is a very growing, fast-growing region. Especially for the development sector, it is sort of you know a very time-honored track. Uh, people do want to you know, go and, and contribute to Africa because there is a perception, and, and rightly so, that there's you know, there's a lot to be done in Africa and very different challenges. And, and as you know, in organizations like BRAC have massive presence in Africa and, and all that, right? So just, just for, to set the context for those watching. So I remember for people watching, right? Because this is a leadership talk. And although I, I, be, I believe even established leaders will benefit from these discussions, it's always good to be reminded and hear perspectives, but we, we do try to sort of pitch it for uh, younger leaders also, people who are aspiring to be leaders and also the youth, right? So I guess, you know, because, you know, you've done so well, uh, why don't we just rewind a bit, right? We rewind and start, you know, uh, way back. Like, let's just go, you know, past to your childhood stage of, of the sort of, you know, your journey. And why don't we start there? Why don't we talk about some of your early career and childhood experiences, maybe some formative experiences that you've had in your life growing up that helped you in your career development. And these could be biographical experiences, influences from a mentor, someone you looked up to, maybe some habits you picked up. I want to finish up our early childhood of Bishwai, which I think will be interesting for people that, you know, really sort of helped you uh, to reach where you are today. Right, um, great question. Um, we, I need to kind of time travel back a bit. Um, now, to be able to, uh, to respond to your question, I'll just divide these early formative experience into two kind of stages. One stage is more on the academic side of it, the education part of it, and the other part is professional learning and the journey uh, in that sphere. So on the education side of it, um, I, my school was a, out of Dhaka. I was in, in a small town called Narendanj, and my, my, I did my high school in, in that city. So one, two important aspects, I think, of that journey. Uh, one is my school was a great mosaic of the uh, great mosaic uh, of, of the society. We had people from all walks of life, as they would say. Um, my friends were from very different, diverse background, and it was the true representation of the society. And having, having studied with them, the important learning that came into my life was understanding and respecting the diversity and being able to see the value that everybody brings into the table. Um, so breaking down the stereotype is, was very important learning at a very early stage of my life and my educational career. So, so that was one interesting aspect which I carried all through uh, to be able to kind of understand and value diversity. Uh, and the second part is I would definitely talk about one teacher who influenced me a lot. He was our Bengali teacher, but he also kind of exposed me to all kinds of readings and, and the political history, uh, the history of mathematical evolution and the concept of mathematics and everything. So he never confined himself as a Bengali teacher. 
এবং আরেকটা খুব বড় ব্যাপার ছিল ওনার বৈশিষ্ট্য সেটা হচ্ছে যে হি এক্সপোজ মি টু ওয়ার্ল্ড লিটারেচার বাংলা সাহিত্যে মানে হি হেল্প মি হি অ্যাকচুয়ালি কিউরেটেড মাই মাই রিডিং হ্যাবিট সো হি অলওয়েজ গাইডেড মি হোয়াট শুড আই রিড এট সার্টেন এজ and and there if there are new books available and published not only in uh, from bangladesh but from other parts of the world which got translated into english or, or which got translated into bengali he played a major major role and and because of his interest i got exposed to the idea of debating and that mm-hmm. is yeah i know about your debating successes by the way I'm, and and uh, <laughs> it's actually widely known but anyway born yeah, yeah. But i think the important part is to understand the dialectics and the and the and how logic should be framed and and engage into a topic from a very logical perspective to be able to see um, the connections between apparently two disconnected concepts so so that exposure to logical thinking uh, at a very early stage of my education um, i think that helped me a lot later in my professional career as well as throughout my life then in the college i was in notre dame college again it was a college run by missionaries but the whole idea of secularism in that educational institution was was very powerful and i think that also helped me to learn tolerance and and look beyond uh, transactions look beyond basic achievements to a much broader cause because this whole college is run based on a very noble um cause which is about creating future leaders investing in society's development through education and and also that uh, that was a very interesting kind of thing because in college that was the first dichotomy that i realized that there are two bangladeshis there are two bangladesh one is a very urban middle class uh forward looking bangladesh so we had friends who came from uh very famous schools in dhaka like um saint joseph uh, government lab so they were well ahead uh, compared to people like us who were coming from um from outside dhaka mofoshol shoharer school theke asha amra jara chhatro chilo so that interesting dichotomy was was a great learning experience for me that before that we never realized that there can be so many bangladeshis existing in one bangladesh so but at the same time we get to sit together we learn together and we also understood how we can get integrated to become one uh, great nation so that's another important learning for me during that stage uh, and then dhaka university was a massive learning ground for me uh, being able to debate being able to engage on all kinds of extracurricular activities uh, being part of the film society then go into debating organizing debating societies establishing debating societies and all so it was a great and and most importantly being exposed to the political discourse of the of the nation so nice. public universities and public institutions i think had been a great learning experience for me from diversity perspective from being able to understand bangladesh and being able to understand the challenge that somebody who for the first time comes to dhaka for the university admission purpose and and the challenges around finding a place to live accommodation um and then being able to connect with people who are completely from a different background much better off uh, urban middle class background that connections are quite important and during my dhaka university days during debating during this political discourse i try to kind of understand and try to see beyond what we see now for example often we blame uh, student politics being uh, not so not so liberal not so progressive etc etc and we tend to kind of question why till people join student politics knowing that student politics probably is not at its best form nowadays have we ever thought that the weakness of the infrastructure in dhaka university is one of the major cause of people joining politics dhaka university student der jodi thakar jayga samadhan kora jeto tahole probably amader student politics er ekta birat part amra handle korte partam because dhakar baire theke gaibandha theke je chhele ta prothom dhakay thakte ashe ebong dhakay porte ashe ও যখন হলে থাকার জায়গা পায় না 
তার জন্য একমাত্র চয়েস টু ফাইন্ড এ স্পেস টু লিভ ইন ঢাকা ইস টু জয়েন স্টুডেন্ট পলিটিক্স কাজী ঢাকা ইউনিভার্সিটিতে ওয়েন উই ওয়ার ডিবেটিং এন্ড ডিলিং অন দিস ইস্যুস সেখানে কিন্তু এই ইস্যুগুলো অলসো হেল্প মি লেটার ইন মাই প্রফেশনাল ক্যারিয়ার টু আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড দ্য বিগার পিকচার এন্ড দ্য চ্যালেঞ্জেস সো আমরা যখন প্রফেশনাল ওয়ার্ল্ডে এখন কাজ করি উই ট্রাই টু আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড হোয়াট ইজ দ্য কোর কনস্ট্রেন্ট দ্যাট ইজ হোল্ডিং ব্যাক দ্য সিস্টেম ফর ফ্রম বেটার পারফর্মিং and we see that some of the core reasons for under performance of a system is not related to the system that we are talking about probably the problem lies somewhere else yeah so during the public university days i think some i some of these issues started to appear quite strongly then um one of the teachers that we had in our economics department he still there akash sir professor m m akash uh he helped me a lot he he was very instrumental in giving us uh exposing us to a very pragmatic view of economic thoughts and economic systems so akash sir played an important role in my idea uh, looking at bangladesh and my early stage of understanding of economic theories and behaviors rational behavior or political economy of different policy debates and finally i think two important episodes uh one i started my career in advertising actually not in international development so so i started uh, my career um looking after brand communication for one of the very popular and famous um soap brand of bangladesh um and in in marketing communication i i learned the importance of storytelling how quickly you have one has to tell the story influence the behavior of a consumer and change the decision making process in favor of the product so so this was a great learning for me which i carried later into our our world of international development and how we can use communication for behavior change because essentially in international development a big part of what we do is about behavior change so so that part was also quite important and interesting and how we can utilize the marketing concepts and the tools of marketing communication advertising in international development was also quite quite important and later when i joined uh, dfid uh, the british government's international development organization there i have learned the political angle of international development we have all studied about it when we have studied international development or or development discourse or public policy but having worked in an international development organization a major bilateral donor organization for bangladesh that was a big exposure to the political economy of international development and how the negotiations take place how large development programs are designed and where you know the political economy the international politics influence the choice of development instruments that that was a great learning experience for me so yeah that's that's the journey i had and some of the learnings i had from different experiences so not to unpack what you've done so just for the sake of readers uh things i got out of this response from you i could say that you were clearly an avid reader and of course you know they say that readers make leaders and i believe it's clearly true uh second i'd say that you clearly connected with people your teachers you have had this differential as a relationship it seems with your mentors and you allowed them to influence you which is important right because i'm honestly sure my bully uh, a lot of young people will come and say sir we lack motivation or we lack inspiration but to some extent right you have to seek out motivation and and it's a two way street and it does seem like you had those sorts of relationships you mentioned something interesting about how the school you went to was a microcosm of society so that exposure to diversity i think is extremely important Uh, so that's something that i think is worth keeping in mind for young people watching uh, uh you also talked about you know other formative sort of skills you picked up you talked about debating are uh, debating and actually debating it a bhalo uh, positive consequences both direct and indirect in in developing a human being in developing a thinker in developing a problem solver also in developing just someone who can connect with people i think is is very very underestimated and underrated I wonder where we're headed as you know in, in terms of a country economic debate. I know Dhaka University still has a debating club. 
and, and, and a lady who runs a debating club is working with us at ULAB at CES, et cetera, so we partner with that. So this is something that I definitely appreciate a lot you mentioning the importance of that dialectical method. You talked about the importance of understanding politics and something else that I think pops out of your answer is you're very, um, you almost have this, not a dedication per se, but you are built to imbibe knowledge as from different prisms, from different interdisciplinary prisms, right? You like, clearly you liked your stint in marketing, you liked fine arts, you liked creativity, you have a passion for literature, movies, et cetera. So on I mean, they hit you. A little plot for you lab here, of course, uh, because I, I find that people will often wonder, right? Why does it? Why do we need to study history, or why should we care about literature? And I went to a liberal arts school myself, so I know for a fact that, you know, looking back, though, it will make sense, and you will be able to use knowledge, focus of knowledge, skills, in different places, especially in a leadership position, uh, because you have to connect with people. And the more knowledge you have about, you know, about different topics, it, 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 they, they will be, you'll be able to weaponize the knowledge, uh, uh, so to speak. So thank you, uh, Anirandha. That was a very lovely, uh, yeah, please go ahead. No, just actor Bishra, just one point. Um, the more people read, they get exposed to different ways of thinking. Linear thinking could be important to be able to be efficient and plan things on our day-to-day -day basis. And that helps us to do things right. But I think one important aspect is to periodically ask, are we doing the right things? effectiveness measure we ask that question, are we doing the right things? lateral thinking becomes more important to be able to look at a problem from multiple angles. Akoni lateral thinking the way I don't know whether I've learned it yet, but at least being able to when somebody had read so many different things from literature to history to politics to even very papy popular novels. Um, everything is important because it adds layer to yeah. somebody's ability to analyze a problem. Yeah. And, and I find it extremely important to be able to analyze a problem from multiple angles. Um, it's not just about um, political issue. It's not just about economical issue. A problem has got so many different multifaceted layers and interconnectedness of the whole ecosystem. <clears throat> so from that aspect, I think it's important that we spend enough time reading um, and read whatever we get. It does not have to be a very carefully planned reading process. We just need to read right, left and center. We just need to read, absolutely. I'm gonna suggest a final thought on this topic. Uh, there was a time I was having a conversation uh, with the vice president of the ULAB trustee, Dr. Anis, and we were discussing the stock market crash of 2010. And, and you know, I, I used to be a stock market professional in my previous life. I was with Bracky Field. I was director of Bracky Field. In order to completely unpack the crash and communicate to how it happened and why it happened to foreign investors, which is basically the business that I was dealing with, it just wasn't a problem of, you know, demand supply. People, there was more demand than supply, so a bubble happened and then it fell. There was also things like the role of rumor. In a society like Bangladesh, with our demographic dividends, so to speak, uh, rumors do spread like wildfire. There was there were things like the role of journalism, or the inefficient role of journalism in that case. Some of the onik shomai dekha jito jara market ne likto. These were people who were not trained in financial journalism, right? So, and it was also an anthropological problem, right? Like how, you know, uh, people make certain decisions that it, 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 given the cultural constraints that they live in. So, yeah, I mean, as you said, and, and for those of you watching, we, we definitely believe, Jay, uh, uh, you know, the best way to solve these problems are, are you know, are the best solutions to problems are multifaceted and multilayered. And multidisciplinary in 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 this, in this in the spirit with which you approach these problems. So, I guess uh, you know a logical question now for you, Anirvanda, would be to talk about um, you know um, the sector that you work in, 
right? It is, of course, a nebulous sector. But by sector, I'm referring to international development at large, the NGO sector, so to speak, NGOs, INGOs, etc. On a key sector, Shonga Jane, Ebo Oniki Janena, Ebo Oniki Hatu would love to get updated information about the sector insofar as it pertains to Bangladesh, because it is a sector that you you know, have spent a lot of time in, and I'm sure are very connected to in Bangladesh. So what positive trends do you find in the sector of international development in Bangladesh? And maybe what challenges or risks do you foresee uh, in the sector in the next, in the future? So international development sector is very closely connected to the core cause of why a state needs to exist. Karan, when we work, when we look at the role of the state, every state wants to maximize um, the well-being of the citizens. Akon, whenever the states failed to cater to the needs of the society, it gave birth to parallel ideas of um, it development. Um, so essentially, uh, my, I would start by saying that um, the, inter the develop delivering the development results in a country or creating a state mechanism or ecosystem which will benefit people who are not having enough opportunities in life essentially lies with the state. Since in many instances in different parts of the world, state lack that capacity, that created opportunity for parallel organizations to come and, and take up that space. So the whole idea of international development NGOs started to grow. If states were capable of creating those opportunities for its citizen, probably we would not have seen emergence of NGOs and international organization trying to create benefits and delivering services to, to the people in the country. So the state failure led to the growth of an interesting sector, which is called international development sector. But at the same time in Bangladesh, we have seen slightly in my opinion, we have, in my opinion, we have seen a, a different role between uh, state and the international development organization and NGOs. So state into Bangladesh, NGO their K um, have not seen as a threat. Rather, they have always uh, state has always seen NGOs as a collaborator and often created opportunities so that NGOs can continue to work. So um, the international development space, historically BRAC, it started with BRAC and Grameen Bank, obviously, because um, these two, these two great organizations started the basis for, in, for developing Bangladesh immediately after independence. Among a Twitter organization could interesting opportunity create courage in the process. They have also tried to answer how does Bangladesh development model look like? How much of it is going to be state driven? What is going to be the role of the NGOs? How do we tackle extreme poverty in a context where state does not have enough capacity? Shekhane a experience the Bangladesh journal could be interesting. Aste aste jeto Bangladesh international funding berethe, lots of new ideas also were tested in Bangladesh. So got to ponchash bachhore Bangladesh journey the I think the important part of this sector is we led a lot of innovations for the world to take notice. Even lot of ideas that were tested and tried in Bangladesh eventually traveled in other parts of the world. The ideas were taken from Bangladesh and applied elsewhere in the world. Just to give three examples, I think there are many others. Um, at this point, I'll just talk about three examples. One is obviously the microfinance. We all know about it. It started in Bangladesh and eventually it was it is being tried and tested in so many different contexts across the world. The second part is BRAC's targeted ultra poor program. This is a very powerful intervention targeting extreme poor household, creating a pathway for them and creating pathways of opportunities for them. Then the whole idea of private sector development and engaging small and medium enterprises, facilitating commercialization of agriculture, allowing private sector um, to, to kind of work closely with NGOs and NGOs trying to influence the way private sector builds their business model, 
in a very difficult context where probably private sector would normally not venture out because of the risk and uncertainty in those market segments. So AJ, the concept of harnessing the power of private sector in solving a development challenge. These are some of the interesting ideas which had been tried and tested in Bangladesh, became successful, scaled up, and now they're being replicated across the world. So international development in Bangladesh had always been at the forefront of innovation, forefront of delivering solutions to the last mile, and creating organizations which um, I think are pioneer in many aspects, not only in terms of development solution, but also in terms of how a development organization should run. Now we are now in an interesting crossroad. We all know that Bangladesh has done exceptionally well um, with right public policy, with growing private sector, with the intervention of the NGOs, which means the need for international development is declining. The fund flow in Bangladesh is declining. But at the same time, that doesn't mean the development challenge has been overcome completely. Just the nature of the development challenge has changed. So the absolute poverty probably is declining, but the relative poverty is increasing. The role of the international donor money is changing because probably now in Bangladesh or for next 10, 15 years, we won't need donors plugging the hole in our revenue budget as well as in the development budget as much as they used to do. So obviously we need less uh, money from the donors and the development partners, but we still need their support or we can still utilize those support to continue to innovate and try new ways of development solutions. So for next 10, 15 years, we, in my view, we will see the role of NGOs in providing the last mile solution, last mile health education service will decline. But uh, the role of NGOs will evolve in answering the question, how can we empower private sector or engage with private sector and influence private sector more to bring in more innovative solution benefiting people? So change if there is a development challenge in Bangladesh or the development challenges that we will see in Bangladesh, what role state will play? What role private sector will play in solving that problem? And the role of NGOs will move from a service delivery point of view to a more facilitation point of view. So the, the services that we have seen NGOs providing at the last mile directly probably will be replaced by private sector. And already we are seeing different startup coming up, different private investments coming up. The whole idea of impact investment is coming through, which is yet to be uh, tested and, and yeah. unpacked. So the role of the NGO is going to change. But Jara, Bangladesh NGO sector by international development sector I think the whole world is becoming the playground because of all the reasons that I've mentioned. In Bangladesh, we have successfully proven how we can reduce extreme poverty. We have successfully proven how can we engage private sector in a more market-oriented way for delivering a development solution. We have learned to create a more pragmatic ways of engaging public sector, influencing public sector um, in facilitating private sector led growth. So, so these sort of changes I think would become very apparent and we are already seeing in Bangladesh that the funding, the absolute amount of funding from the international community is declining. Mm -hmm. The kind of project that they would like to fund is changing and the level of engagement is also changing. Uh, between international donors and the host community NGOs. So I think we are now in an interesting crossroads. Absolutely. What I also foresee happening is that these the, the crossroads, like most cross, crossroads tend to, will also be a good filter, with, which I think will separate some of the more nimble agencies from those that are not. Because you know, if you just look at the sort of calls that are coming out these days, I recently saw this call for proposal that had to do with the startup ecosystem. And there are lots and lots of development agencies getting into the startup ecosystem, right? They're trying to see, this is a niche we can occupy. This is what the private sector is doing. This is what the government is doing, but perhaps we need to play this role or that role. Impact investment, and of course, that's something that even a lot of my Indian contacts and associates are you know, really getting into because 
and that's uh, I'm seeing deals being closed in India. I think from the regulatory front, right? Because if you look at the investment part of impact, we still have ways to go in terms of, you know, whether it's capital repatriation and all those sorts of things. And and in general, private equity investment to Bangladesh quite a honey because also because I'm under the exit strategy will actually, you know, uh, it's it's a multi-pronged problem again. It has to do with capital markets, it has to do with the financial services ecosystem, it has to do with the financial regulator, in addition to preparedness of our workforce to, you know, get into that sort of, you know, double or triple bottom line. Yeah, people touch it. No, no, I just wanted to elaborate the last point that you have mentioned. It's part of the bigger development challenge. You know? so, yeah. um, early days of private sector development, the way we have seen private sector growing versus now the role the private sector plays in Bangladesh in terms yeah. of economic development, creating jobs, creating uh, business opportunities down um, in different parts of the supply chain. Composition has changed. The economy mm -hmm. has become more complex. The mm -hmm. role of private sector has become more complex, multifaceted, yeah. better connection, more integrated. So the development challenge from the private sector point of view is, are we creating the right institution and the regulatory framework which is capable of facilitating private sector, which is very different in nature. Early 80s, early 90s, a private sector role and private sector business at Thorum has completely changed now. Yeah. We are far better integrated with the international financial market. The technology transfer is happening. International investors are taking keen interest in Bangladesh. We are also promoting Bangladesh as the next investment destination. Critical right regulatory environment and the institutional landscape. Yeah. Are our institutions ready and fit for purpose to tackle a way more complex private sector um, space? That's one. The second question is private sector creating greater value for people in general. It took into change. We are seeing a huge growth of informal micro and small medium enterprises because of the economic development and the growth. private sector business how do we ensure that the private sector's role creates greater value for the society? Among a regulatory environment among institution into it's also connected. COVID uh, the informal micro and small businesses suffered the most because they have they are, they are, they were the least resilient, but they were the biggest employer and bread earner for the society. Kaji, a debate gula into international development te Bangladesh perspective theke dosh bolshor age hoye to prominent chilo na. Ebang if debate gula amar dishti te akon these are the critical issues. Ebang jara NGO te ashben kach korte future professionals ebang future leaders. Tadher ke kintu they will have to come equipped with a very different type of um, skill set. Which yeah. is more aligned towards understanding private sector, understanding market, understanding role of the state, innovation, Even innovation, absolutely. Even being agile, knowing how best to pivot um, solutions. Even a shabgular khetre actor competence would become way more important. Sheta hote the analytical ability and being able to connect different dots. A system er complexity buchte parata. I think is going to be absolutely critical competence for people coming into development sector. People will not Absolutely. be judged uh, based on efficiency. Project management skill set or efficient delivery work would become a hygiene factor. This mm -hmm. is not these skill sets are not going to be uh, the wow factor, which is not mm -hmm. going to be they're not going to be the differentiating factor. Mm -hmm. Those will be hygiene factor, problem solving, project management, efficient delivery quality delivery of work, communication given. The important part would be being able to understand a very complex system and being able to understand how different systems are interconnected, different dots are connected. Yeah. I would go back to my earlier comment, being able to think laterally. Act a problem, perspective, it's going to be more and more important, which we are losing in the society. I agree. And as a matter of fact, um, there are many personal anecdotes that I'm sure you're aware of that I won't get into details about right now. But 
I, I do think I'm there, especially development sector, especially local NGOs. And of course, there are many, many outstanding local NGOs with just, you know, mind blowing levels of innovation. So I'm not talking about those e excellent NGOs, whether the Brax and Sajidas of this world. I'm talking about others. I, 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 have, I do find that I'm on the development sector workforce. You get a lot of people who are good at project management, efficiency driven, project tools, numbers, right? And, and, um, but Johan, to complex challenges, Ashe, whether innovation, business development, because business development is becoming complex for, for NGOs. It's no longer, you know, we're not, we're not flooded by calls like we used to be. And, and, and technology involvement, so especially way back, people used to copy paste a lot of proposals, right? People used to act on borrow NGO to program launch school and there were a lot of imitators. And we went far with this sort of imitation model. We created entire <laughs> sectors using this imitation model, whether it was through proposals or whether it was, whether it was level of implementation or business models. But Akon, it's becoming competitive. And Akon, it's all, a lot of these things will be reduced to hygiene, as you said. Oh, yeah, you want mm. to say something? Go ahead. It is okay. I'm on the development sector, just one point. The way we used to create uh, a specialization in our sector. In early days or throughout the time, since the development challenge was massive, it was a massive delivery challenge. The big focus was on creating a very efficient machinery which is capable of delivering large scale solution at a competitive price. The whole idea will can also look at it from a pure business perspective. The market is huge. The challenge is huge. We don't need a lot of innovations. As long as we can get the product out, create an efficient delivery channel, it will reach the mass. So international development early days in Bangladesh, the challenge was also a bit like that. And this is also a challenge when we talk about humanitarian development context where uh, we are providing emergency response. The, the key metrics there is how quickly we can take the supply out to the people who are in dire need of certain uh, sure. product. Or sure, sure, sure. But we move from that humanitarian emergency response to a more complex development segment, development pathway then it becomes way more complicated. Now, we historically in development sector, we used to think that people who are working in the field, their job is to deliver the solution on the ground very efficiently. And we will have somebody in Dhaka or we will get somebody from outside Bangladesh who would come and do the thinking part of it. And, and we have created these layers where we have seen uh, people who are good at delivery, because they've been tasked to deliver. And we have got people who are great in terms of thinking and connecting dots and writing strategies. And I think gradually that, that different, that, that, that um, segmentation became blurred. More and more people were asked to deliver. While they're delivering, they were asked to think as well. Among a change into it's very important change. And I think this change came, um, if I can think of around mid 2000, 2006, seven, when private sector de development, uh, private sector led economic development, inclusive growth related agenda starts to take place. Even I would say my orientation, my introduction to international development or the development field was interesting because I was challenged to implement as well as to design program. So, so in my early stage of my career, I had to do both. And I was lucky to be able to work with colleagues and in institution where it was a norm. It was a basic expectation that there is nobody who is going to deliver your program and your job is to design it. So the, the, the terms of reference was very clear. You have to write the strategy. You have to determine what you are going to deliver on the ground. And then you have to go out and travel across Bangladesh to deliver this on the ground and if it is not working you will also have to figure out why it is not working so this whole end to end solution that i was asked to develop as well as deliver played a very important role in my professional development because then i later when i joined international uh, defeat as a donor i knew how an intervention or a policy discussion or or a government decision can impact a farmer on the ground. And that came because I ran that course 
end sure. to end. And I think going forward, this would become more and more important. And this is the skill set that people will have to develop increasingly where people can learn and implement and learn at the same time. I have a couple more questions, but uh, as do a lot of people watching. So I have about 10 questions, but I won't get into all of them. So I apologize in advance if I'm not able to. But actor Poshna, I'll just take from the audience right now. It's someone, it's someone I think is known to you, Mr. Razik Fazle. And uh, so Mr. Fazle has to say, uh, he's asking, how about non-economic development challenges? Question mark. This is in relation to the question we just discussed. The challenges his question is, how about non-economic development challenges? Question mark. Human rights, comma, political stability, comma, social value addition, et cetera, question mark. Development efforts on those are still valid. Those are also interconnected parts of the system, right? Over to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think the role of the NGOs become interesting because Ami Kothabulechi from mainly from the economic development perspective, because that's my core area of specialization. And that, that always stays at the forefront of my thinking. But I completely accept that there are non-economic development challenges around governance, around political system, creating a more pluralistic governance system, respecting human rights, uh, which are more connected to the political economy and political space, political dialogue of it and then whole democratic institution building, which is absolutely important to create a more balanced and more balanced economic development or balanced development. Now, the question is, what is going to be the role of the NGOs in that space? I'm not saying that these issues are not important. These issues are absolutely, absolutely important, or even sometimes uh, the academicians would say that probably creating the right democratic space and the good governance structure is more important than immediately delivering the economic development. Uh, but at the same time, I think the question is, is this the role of the NGOs and what role the NGOs can play in this space? So in my view, the role of the NGOs in this space can be more uh, awareness building, creating those space of civic engagement, civil, res civil society response on some of these issues. Critical issue, what is going to be the financing model of these NGOs and how that financing model would look like in terms of the organizational sustainability. Because if NGOs are always dependent on external funding for their operation, then comes the question, who has an incentive to finance this institution promoting human rights? Interesting debate, which has never taken place. Yeah. And I think we started, the NGO sector in Bangladesh started from the right-based perspective, promoting human rights, good governance, women economic empowerment. But at the same time, when the organizational sustainability question came into place, they moved to service delivery. And they started to kind of experiment with different financing modality. So Amar Kachi Mona is a non-economic development who is going to finance that? At this point in time in our society, the whole idea of civic engagement has died down. Yeah. At least in our early stage, when we were young, there were clubs, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, Rover Scouts. There were various, form of, various forms of civic engagement. At civic engagement, Impetusta, we have lost a bit. We have lost the momentum. So probably this is this non-economic development related issues will be better handled by civil society organizations which are not dependent on external funding. Even ekhane bodhe ekta innovation er scope ache to think of financing of these initiatives. How can we create a pressure group or or awareness raising platform which will engage society on non-economic development related issues and act as a pressure group uh, on the political institution, political parties, state-led institutions to behave differently or to create a more pluralistic space. So, so 
and who mm -hmm. believe in a greater cause of state building and 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 societal development amader ekhane ektu innovative hoar proyojon ache typical donor funding in human rights governance i am not necessarily thinking along these lines as a more sustainable solution it has to be led right. by the, by the civil society and the citizens of the country sure sure uh, one of our active audience members has responded uh, uh, to some of the discussions we're having and i just want to read out his response he's been very active so thank you for that his name is avi hossein from ilo and he said, Jay, I think, this is, I'm quoting him, I think what the development professionals lack mostly in our country is to be able to see the bigger picture. I mean, people fail to see where project level benef benefits and services at beneficiary levels are converging towards big macroeconomic and development pictures, i.e. the skills development projects are happy to claim and say we have trained X number of people and developed capacities of Y number of institutes. But what does it mean for the labor market of Bangladesh? What does it mean for employment? We barely see, try to see and link. It will, it needs to obviously is something that I'm sure you've talked about with your team, something that I often see. Uh, uh, I do sense that talking again to my someone overseas, especially I see in India, uh, people, there's a lot of, there are skilled, there are skilled people who think like this because on AK, they had the development sector in other markets that I've seen from non-development professions, from startups from from you know consulting jobs from corporate jobs it's happening in bangladesh i know you're doing it at swiss contact it's happening but it's taking a bit longer i think karun kemon jani amar mon hoy je amader deshe development sector is almost like a parallel stream to the other streams which is an opportunity to segue to my next question uh, and feel free to take your time answer it's our next question to hoche keeping in mind everyone who's watching who wants to perhaps get into the NGO space in Bangladesh, the INGO space in Bangladesh. What advice do you have for people who are either early career or mid career? And you might have differences of advice for them, uh, for people who might want to work for Swiss Contact, for people who might want to work for any other INGO or NGO in terms of what they should do, how should they should, how they should prepare, et cetera. Over to you. I think um, going back to the question, uh, the comment that ability to see the bigger picture um, is absolutely critical. Ebong, I think it's not only for the international development professionals, it's for any professionals. People will have to have the skill set to be able to connect the day-to-day -day operation with the bigger picture. Uh, how our activities on a daily level can influence the bigger picture. Why are we doing it? Uh, we need to train certain number of people, so what? Why can we not do it differently? Why can we not solve the same challenge in a different manner? So first, I think that ability to understand the bigger picture is absolutely critical for any job. It's not about international development because that would allow any professional to question that very important thing. Are we doing the right things? And is there an alternative way of doing the same thing? Individually, I mean, the action professional, the professional who would ask this question definitely would be would try to find a different answer to the problem. Then automatically that person would be seen as an innovative uh, member, staff member of the organization. And any manager or any senior leader would value um these skill set like anything so so to be able to be, see the bigger picture and being able to connect the day-to-day -day operation with that bigger picture taking a side step is very important now Sajipe, going back to your question what are the factors that a young professional should consider when looking at uh international development as a career first and most important thing is what why do i want to get into this sector is an important question do i want to get into this sector because of um, the financial rewards and the perks of working in this sector because uh, some multinational development organization etc cetera, etc cetera, provide excellent uh, pay packages do i want to come into that for this reason or do i want to come into this sector because i want to get a job 
which allows me to see my own country better because in any international development job or any development sector job, people will have to travel across the country because that's where the action lies. Do I want to work in a sector which gives me an opportunity to influence or contribute to life-changing experience for hundreds and thousands of people? Do I believe in the greater cause of contributing into society's transformation? If the answer is yes to this question, only then somebody should come to international development because pay package, traveling, being able to have a good work-life balance, et cetera, et cetera. These are very short-term, quick incentives. But the greater incentive is if I believe in the cause that I want to work in a sector which has a purpose, and that purpose is to transform the society, contribute to create benefits and value for a lot of people. If I want to be a purpose-driven individual, not just profit or financial reward driven individual in my professional career, that would be for me the litmus test of this question. If the answer is yes, only then somebody should, should come and pick this uh, as a career. Um, at least that was the cause in my case, because I would say that if I have not chosen international development or development cooperation as my career, I would have never understood Bangladesh. I would have never seen Bangladesh the way I've seen Bangladesh. I would not have the opportunity to, to interact with people from so many different continents and see their lives and being able to kind of design solutions which changes people's life. So when I when I see when I when I when I go back to uh, different parts of Bangladesh and suddenly one farmer comes to me and says that I remember you, we did this, and now I can grow four crops instead of my two crops. And I know how to differentiate a hybrid seed, good quality seed from a retained seed, bad quality seed, et cetera, et cetera. That gave me an immense pleasure. I felt like, okay, now there is a greater cause and greater purpose of the job that I have. It may sound a bit idealistic, but that's at the end of the day is the core of every development professional's choice of picking international development development cooperation as a career. Now, I'm not saying that other organization or other sectors do not have that cause, but in other sectors, which are more for profit or profit oriented, profit supersedes often the greater cause of that industry. So, so that is important. And the second important part in terms of the choice of the career is we will have to be open to travel outside Bangladesh and being able to relocate because international, when we work for development cooperation, we will have to think beyond, think of a career beyond Bangladesh. And that's a reality because international development or development sector, the traditional development sector is shrinking in Bangladesh. The need for investment in international development development cooperation is somewhere else. Because, because, okay, I should, let me be very candid here. The money flow is moving away from Asia to other parts of the world. Now, if we do not want to be, invest in becoming a global development professional, then a younger, mind younger professionals should not consider international development as a career now because Bangladesh would become smaller as an industry. Bangladesh has done a great job. And I always tell that we are in an industry where our main job is to make ourselves, make ourselves redundant. redundant. So, yeah. so when we are successful, ideally we will not have our jobs. Probably that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. That's the, that's the success parameter. So the young professional should, should, should look at it more from a, a global career perspective. And, and then if they feel they would like to work for a greater cause, they're ready to invest, they're ready to travel extensively outside Dhaka, live in areas where they probably will never get the comfort that they're used to in their own place. That's where um, the rubber would hit the road and they can make that decision. 
But the other side of the story is it can be an extremely rewarding professional. It would allow somebody to understand own country's people well. There will be a greater sense of accomplishment, huge amount of learning uh, that would come through this, which is also transferable because I know a lot of our colleagues who started their career in international development. They have taken that learning and designed their own private business and initiative, which is much more innovative because they're trying to solve a problem for their clientele base, which a traditional private sector had never thought of solving. So they always started with, with a heads up and headwind that they always had. Um, you know, they understand the country, they understand the challenge far, far better and they pick a problem of the consumer, which traditional private sector has never seen as a problem. So they have a greater probability of becoming successful in designing an innovative business model, uh, unique business model compared to more traditional private sector. Awesome. Anirvanda, Anishwani Lamapar, I just want to have one last question. So what advice or counsel or wisdom can you share for academics watching? For you, <laughs> you're one yourself, uh, for university uh, practitioners, for people who are designing courses, if that be. Because how can universities be more uh, relevant with regard to creating talent, not creating talent, but fine tuning talent, creating skilled workforce for international development. I mean, AKJ, you know, I mean, you have MDS programs, right? MDS programs are all the rage, whether it's BRAC or DU or elsewhere. Uh, but I keep with us, for example, ULAB, we have a media studies department, a pretty well regarded one, and, and we have a development focus in our, you know, in our coursework. What else can or should universities be doing in, in so that we have better prepared early career professionals coming out of universities for to contribute to this changing development landscape? Um, okay, I'm no way qualified enough to advise the academicians. Academically, I'm, I'm fairly basic. So what I can tell from a practitioner's perspective, like where I've struggled, as a practitioner when I was looking for a solution sure. from the academy. So I would, I would approach it more from that perspective because when I had to run organizations, I had to recruit people, number one. So that's one interface with the academia. The second interface with the academia I had as a practitioner is whenever I was trying to design, we were trying to design development solutions, we were trying to look at academia's experience because academia take a much more objective look at a problem and try to find uh, a more critical view of whether a solution had worked or not. Because when we work from an organization, we often have a bias uh, because of a lot of vested interests and the political economy attached to certain solutions that we have tried to promote on the ground. Now, from these two aspects, first people side of it, I think our academia, it's changing for sure. It has been improving, but I think not enough has been done to prepare our students for the world of the work. And somehow, particularly our public universities, especially the Department of Economics, Social Science and Development Studies, they have a view that everybody would become an academician at some point and they would become a researcher. But reality is a big part of the students who studied economics or who are studying economics development studies would become somebody like me, who is not, who is a user of academic research, but not necessarily would be a researcher by themselves, himself or herself. So, so we, our curriculum and the whole process, the learning process is designed uh, with an ambition of making everybody a researcher. So there is a lot of theoretical aspect of it, but not enough discussion about how these theories are being practiced and translated in real life. And, and what where the theories are becoming effective in creating an implementable solutions, an implementable solution or where theories are, are creating greater knowledge, more abstract knowledge, which probably contributes to greater knowledge creation, but does not necessarily contribute to day-to-day um, operational solutions. So, so this, this lens is not being applied enough. 
to determine how are we equipping our future professionals? How are we, what are we doing to improve their uh, dialectic skills to be able to understand problem? We assume that they would learn it automatically as they study economic theories and et cetera, et cetera. But it, these skill sets needs to be nurtured and people need to be taught how to communicate. So, so that is missing. I think the, the academia is not engaging with industry by asking that question, what are the challenges that you face when you recruit students from our department? Where are they successful, where are they not? So that question I think needs to be asked by academia proactively, more proactively, and, and look at the problem from the practitioner's perspective. That's one. Now, the second part is where academia is not trying to understand the practitioner's um, technical problem is we are not talking to each other. Uh, the theories are being taught, uh, but we are kind of implementing those theories on the ground. We have taken the, the theoretical framework, converted into a daily and implementable solution. We have, we have filled kind of reduce the theories to daily activities. And that's where that conversation and the dialogue needs to take place. Like if we talk about the role of the market and the enterprise and how enterprises behave, we work with small and medium enterprises day in, day out. Then our experience of understanding the challenges of enterprises is very practical experiences are very practical. That needs to be corroborated with the theoretical framework. And, and we need to talk more about that. And, and I think the academicians are not wearing the practitioner's shoes. And we, are, we as practitioners are shying away from the academic world um, and not engaging in that discourse because we are saying that we are too busy implementing our day-to-day -day operational challenges. So that, that bridge is completely missing. And I, I think if we look at the economics department of Dhaka University, which is my alma mater, so I, I think I can, I have a right to criticize that department. Our teachers and the colleagues or friends who are teaching in that department have never approached any ex-student of economics department who are practitioners and who are leading the development organizations and asking, why don't you come and talk about your challenges or the way you see development and you have experienced development being a practitioner as part of development economics course? Then people will be able to see, the students will be able to see how, what is the view of a practitioner when it comes down to poverty alleviation, more commercial agriculture, or some of the non-economic development related challenges. How do these institutions or these organizations are dealing with these issues and what the theory says. So we are not putting theory and practice hand in hand, side by side, to be able to compare and contrast. And that's where the learning is missing. And the interface between the world of education and the world of work is, is getting lost. Yeah, very much so. I totally agree with you. And we're discussing this offline. So that's something, um, honestly, uh, maybe this is a plug, but we act I actually deeply care about this nexus between practice and academia, as does our vice chancellor and uh, uh, and the board. So I, I do think uh, it is something that I think needs to be addressed. And it just it shouldn't just be ULAB, it should be every university, because I'm just going to be this policy, something that I've really valued university education, uh, in university education, other than the fact that our teachers were mostly practitioner come academics who had a way of relating coursework to real, real world stuff is access to practitioners. Like, in fact, on a master's PhD, because academia is how you get jobs. Academia, not just through career services, it's just this great intellectual networking opportunity, intellectual slash practical, you know. But I think you want to add something on it, right? I saw your yeah. hand raised. No, sorry, Sajid, but I can see a question um, yeah. in the chat box, and sure. uh, I don't. I would like to answer this question because I think uh, this is a relevant question, which came sure. from Nevas Kushid. And Not the question Kushid, is: yeah. that, Let's take this question and then wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the question is about how, 
the broader sense of the question is how do we prepare as a young professional for international career and the related question was uh, another question was around volunteerism i think bangladeshi professionals have a great opportunity to become global professionals i have worked with colleagues from different parts of the world i think bangladeshi colleagues bring in entrepreneurial attitude they bring in a very resilient attitude to work and stress handling um, they are well equipped from the uh, country based experience of development what we lack is a communication skill set b uh, we lack our appreciation of multiculturalism we have a tendency to to apply a very monochromatic lens when it comes down to workplace culture and work relationship so we are not international enough often to be able to interact with a global uh, workforce and then i think our other point is about uh, you know being able to articulate the problem and be open to different solutions often we are quite rigid in what we do and then we do not necessarily start early in our career exploring international opportunities i personally was quite late in exploring international opportunities i think when i look at some of the experiences of our, our colleagues who come from different countries they started exploring the global world much earlier um they left their country accepted volunteerism uh they they did lots of different works they were much more versatile in exploring their professional um career and and doing diversified job and we have a tendency to only look at career in a very linear way we always expect that the next promotion will, i can only grow if i have a next promotion and upgradation in my designation and the role but the reality is often the actual growth in the career comes from horizontal functions not necessarily uh, vertical growth and being specialized so we have a tendency to only value specialization but in early stage of our career if we side step and if we get into different functions that would help us to become a much more rounded profession which we which we don't do often in our early stage of the career so so if i can share one wisdom with or one mistake or one thing that i have not done early enough i think i have not adapted the horizontal roles early enough in my career i have not ventured out early enough in my career into international spaces and 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 accepted different roles and i have not done enough volunteerism if you like or or internship there were other various reasons for not doing it but my advice would be if i may give any advice start early in your career go out in the world accept roles which you are not necessarily connected to your um area of specialization but that would give you an extra advantage and don't only look at the financial reward of the role if you can afford to accept roles which are not necessarily financially rewarding but will be giving you great learning opportunity if your personal circumstances allow that please go for it don't don't wait and and one practical advice is don't get into the trap of the tuition and private tuition business this is going to be the killer in terms of the career because in private tuition we can make so much money often but we don't learn anything and that doesn't add any value in the in the career so even if um wherever possible downgrade the emphasis on the financial reward it learning over emphasis on the learning and the and the job part of it um uh, and 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 leave the country for learning purpose as soon as possible so that you can come back to the country as a better professional and contribute better how beautiful and the best words with which to end this talk thank you anirvanda this has been uh, wonderful very very uh, um edifying very um, satisfying for me personally and i'm sure it was for everyone i'm not the only thing uh, we haven't had the opportunity to catch up this was great but uh but a bigger thank you to all of you watching Uh, thank you for joining uh stay tuned for future events like these either on the dhaka tribune page dhaka tribune is our partner and especially the center for enterprise and society page the cs page at ulab uh, and we hope to have you in our next events 
thanks once again to DT and to my team and Anirvanda Bhavasakhan. Hope to see you again in Dhaka soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It has been a great pleasure and honor for me to be able to share a few experiences that I had um, managed to collect in this small journey. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm, I'm really humbled for this opportunity. Likewise. Thank you, Arivanda. That's it. And see you all again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.